Good afternoon, webinar attendees. Welcome to Fame Community Outreach 9, where Chris DeLuca, Sally Samuels, and Tom Netting will address new guidance on R2T4s, SAP, LOAs, FSEOG, and more. You can find the handout in the right column panel, and questions will be addressed at the end. All right, take it away. All right. Welcome, everyone. One of so um, I don't know, Sally. Do you want to go over the housekeeping tips, or do you want me to uh, to go through this, or Crystal? We just flash through them just so that they have them. Go ahead and go to the next screen. All right. So yeah, any questions? Submit it via the chat feature, and uh, at least for my part, I will do my best to provide whatever answers I can because uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is. Not necessarily, that doesn't really have anything to do with COVID-19, um, but it's really the, the new Title IX regulations. Um, that is something that in addition to, or on top of everything that schools are dealing with right now, on top of the changes in the delivery of education, going to temporary distance education, now working with your schools and your regulators and your creditors and the department on transferring or transitioning back to your campus locations and what does that look like? All the issues that, that schools have with the program participation or the Paycheck uh, Protection Program and then also with, uh, uh, with the HERF grants and student plans, institutional plans, schools are reeling. And so on top of all of that, the Department of Education decided to finally issue the Title IX regulations. And so uh, the proposed regulations were issued in November of 18 and they have been rumored to be ready to be released for months now. Uh, the department had over 124,000 public comments uh, in response to the proposed regulations. And so where that led us to is where we are today in that. So on top of everything else that we're dealing with, we are now dealing with new regulations that uh, are the regulatory package that was published last Wednesday was over 2000 pages long. So there is a lot uh, to to go through there's a lot to, to think about. And so, but again, those regulations were published on May 6th. They're effective August 14th. So you've really got about 90 days in which to get, to make the changes and to get ready for implementing these new regulations. Um, it's gonna be a, a fast 90 days, I think. There's a lot that schools need to think about. Um, the changes were certainly tipped off in the, in the proposed regulations. So a lot of what's in the final regulations, as you might expect, was, was included in the proposed regulations. But we're gonna what we're going to talk about today is really just go over what's included in the new, in the new regulations and, and talk a little bit about some of the issues that that may raise and things that you should be thinking about uh, as we continue to, again, digest these, this, this, this regulatory package and understand, okay, how does this apply? to uh, non-traditional schools, schools that don't have full-time Title IX officers, don't have full-time Title IX offices and support people, don't have on-campus counselors, don't have on-campus uh, healthcare uh, service providers, don't have on-campus police departments to assist in investigations and things. So, uh, yeah, so th those are challenges for, for many of the smaller schools that are out there. So again, so to emphasize that the, the effective date is August 14th of 2020. And just as an introduction before we get into the specifics of the new regulations is just a reminder or to, and just to think about kind of the overlying, um, go, I don't know if goal is the right word or kind of the, um, you know, the thought process behind the department's change in the regulations. And so there has been, as I'm sure you all know, I mean, there's been a lot of movement back and forth with Title IX over the past decade. There was a lot of uh, guidance that was issued by the Obama administration and really putting an emphasis on schools and their requirements to enforce Title IX, the, protect, the protection uh, against sexual harassment, sexual discrimination on college campuses, making sure that, that schools had policies in place, uh, protecting victims, and one of the challenges that there, or one of the perceived challenges, was that in the rush for schools to show that they were protecting complainants and protecting victims of sexual misconduct, that they may have been rushing to judgment as it relates to those that have been accused of sexual harassment on college campuses. 
And so really the emphasis and that's been placed with these new regulations, and you'll see it as we talk through some of these issues and some of the new requirements, is requiring schools to take a balance and certainly to, you know, in, in the words of Secretary DeVos, provide meaningful ways to support survivors of sexual misconduct without sacrificing important safeguards to ensure a fair and transparent process. So again, the idea is that we can do both, protect survivors of sexual misconduct, but also ensure that anybody who's been accused of sexual misconduct has a fair process uh, before there's a determination of liability on that, uh, with respect to them. So some of the things that are required under the new regulations. So you need to have a policy against, of non-discrimination. Again, that's not really, that's not new. You've always had to have a policy against uh, a, a non-discrimination policy. What's required under the regulations, and quite frankly, you, know, you should have been doing this already, schools, you know, best practices would have had you doing this already, is prominently displaying the Title IX coordinator's contact information. So that needs to be, I don't need to be on your, make sure it's on your website and in your catalog, student handbook, whatever you know, it, information you use with your students, whatever you could call it, a handbook or catalog, but making sure that the Title IX coordinator's uh, contact information is prominently displayed. And that's gonna be important when we talk about the reporting of sexual misconduct, how it's reported, when does the school's obligation to respond to sexual misconduct arise, is triggered by reports to, um, to the Title IX coordinator. So it's important that you've publicized and have that information available so, so students and employees know who the Title IX coordinator is so they know how to and, and, and to whom to report. So you need to make sure you've got grievance policies. So those need to be published again um, and, and make sure that those are available and you need to provide notice of that grievance process and so that and provide notice on what the process is how to report a, uh, a complaint of sexual discrimination or sexual uh, harassment and how the school is going to respond to those and so in the regulations the school uses the word or i'm sorry the department uses the word recipient that's referring to institutions so institutions who receive uh, title or uh, receive federal uh, funding, that's the recipient. So when you see the word recipient, uh, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about institutions. So a couple of things. So the, the regulations go in and they, and they make certain definitions as it relates to Title IX. And it's, so one of the big changes in the regulations is when does a school, when is a school's obligation uh, to respond to a complaint? When is that triggered? Well, it's triggered when the school has actual not a, actual notice of sexual harassment. Um, so then the question is, well, when is a school on notice? And so under the prior guidance, there was this concept of responsible employees. And so under the idea with a responsible employee, that was anybody that was designated by the school to respond to allegations of sexual harassment. So the Title IX coordinator, and if you had, if you designated some other officials at your school as having authority to respond to a sexual harassment or a sexual discrimination complaint, those would, you know, th that would put the school on notice. But there was also this, this idea that anybody to whom a student reasonably believes has the authority to address their complaint of sexual uh, misconduct, well, then that person was a responsible employee and in turn, if a responsible employee had knowledge of an incident, then the school was now on notice. And so what the department has said in these regulations is that they've really limited the idea of, okay, when does a school have actual notice? And they've limited it to, to the Title IX coordinators or any officials that the school designates has the authority to take corrective measures. So this idea of responsible employee is no longer there. Um, under the regulations, it's Title IX coordinator and those other folks at the school who have authority to address the student's complaint. That's the time when the school's on notice. And when the school becomes on notice, that triggers their obligations to, to respond to the student and offer supporting support measures. That triggers and then uh, may trigger the school's obligation to do an investigation and an adjudication. We're going to talk about what that you know what that looks like later but again this this actual knowledge is, is a much more limiting concept than what we've previously operated under uh, under 
prior interpretations and guidance under Title IX. So that's a, that is a big change. And so again, the idea that um, there's you know kind of trying to get away from this uh, this imputing knowledge to the institution based on some other person, some person who who may not have been designated to respond to these issues, that that person again might have fallen under the definition of a responsible employee, and then then triggering the idea that the school is on notice and has a duty to respond. Now it's only if the act if there's actual knowledge to again the Title IX coordinator or others designated to deal with these issues. And that again becomes important in why you want to make sure you've prominently displayed the contact information because that's you know students and employees need to know okay if there if there is an issue this is who I go to if I want the school to take any action on it. They've defined the term complainant so this this gets into the idea with your policies and when you write your procedures you're going to see the term complainant and you're going to see the term respondent. And the idea with the term with those terms is that the the key concept is to treat all the parties fairly throughout a, this process. And so, if we use the words victim, if we use the words uh, accused um, or perpetrator or things like that, that there are negative, you know, there may be certain connotations with that. And so, the idea here is that in your policies, when you describe the parties in the in in the proceeding, you're you're going to use the term complainant to talk about the student or the individual who is alleged alleged to have been the victim who files the complaint or who or, or about whom the complaint has been filed and then respondent will be the person who has been accused but again trying to stay away from what some might perceive as being loaded terms and defining the parties in the process um, so consent so when we talk about sexual misconduct sexual harassment oftentimes the question is, well, did the parties consent to the to engage in the behavior? The department is not requiring a specific definition of consent for Title IX purposes, and that's consistent under, under the Violence Against Women Act. So there are definitions of sexual misconduct under the Violence Against Women Act. And when doing the when when completing the regulations under VAWA, the department took a similar position and said, we're not going to mandate a particular definition of consent. Uh, I, I will note that. Uh, you may have, you may be required to use a particular definition of consent. So, for example, California and New York have very comprehensive campus safety and security laws on their books that mandate an affirmative consent um, policy requirement. So, again, that may be something, depending on where you are, uh, you, you may be required to use a particular definition, so long as it's not inconsistent with federal regulations. Um, there's the regulations bring in the concept of a formal complaint and and re, are going to require that students or employees file a formal complaint before the school initiate its investigation process and so that means a written document um you know something in writing from a complainant saying you know which would be asking the, the institution to take action to 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 do an investigation and one of the things that the department talks about in the preamble to the to the final rules and in, in justifying the changes that are being made is talking about the goal of providing more autonomy uh, to victims of sexual misconduct. And the idea being that you know, rather than under prior rules where where school may have notice of an incident and then go on and, and start an investigation even if the complainant doesn't want the school to start an investigation. The idea here is that you know, it, it's up to the complainant. If they want to talk to some, if they want to keep it confidential, it's their right to keep it confidential. If they want the school to do an investigation, then the means by doing that is filing a formal complaint, which would then trigger the school to say, okay, we've received this formal complaint. Now we've got a duty to uh, to engage our grievance process and we're and there's certain there's a lot of new requirements with the grievance process we'll talk about that in just a moment but again the triggering point to getting the students or i'm sorry getting the institution to do an investigation is the submission of a of a formal complaint and the respondent we talked about that before that's the individual who's who's been reported to be the alleged perpetrator so the standard up till now so in in guidance that the department issued in 2017 so the question is so when is the school required to respond to an incident so under prior guidance if this if the institution knew or reasonably knew about an incident 
they were respond they were required to understand what occurred and respond appropriately so that was the general requirement um, that's been changed and so now there, we've got a new standard now and the standard under the new regs is that a recipient with actual knowledge of sexual harassment in an education program or activity of the recipient must respond promptly in a manner that is not deliberately indifferent so there's a couple of points in there. So again, a recipient with actual knowledge, so that gets back to the definition of actual knowledge. It's not just somebody at the school knows, it's certain people at the school know. And if certain people at the school know, those people that are designated by the school as being responsible for these issues, then the school now has actual knowledge. There's the issue of in an education program or activity of the recipient. So, again, so it needs to be in, in connection with an education program or school activity. So that leads to some of the issues of, well, what if it's an incident that happens off campus between students? And so that's something where, again, it would appear based on uh, going through these regulations and, and what the department has said. So for example, if you've got two students who are dating and something, and they're living in an apartment or you know, off campus and they get in, and there's an incident of domestic violence off campus. Um, is that in connection with an education program or activity of the recipient? Um, probably not. And that's something where, and I say probably, you know, these, these are things that, again, you know, over the next and certainly 90 days before, the, before the, uh, the effective date and as we continue to learn more and kind of process, you know, this, this new regulatory package. But the, but the thought is, is that if it happens off campus, you know, it's, you know, and it's not related to school, it's not part of an education program or activity of the recipient. Now, having said that, one of the things that's clear in the regulations is that even if it's not sexual harassment or sex discrimination under Title IX, the school can still take action against a student or still take a, do an investigation and disciplinary action if it would otherwise violate the school's code of conduct. So that becomes something where, again, I think looking at the changes for Title IX, understanding, okay, what, what action was covered under our prior policies. If, if we make the changes to be compliant with the new policies, okay, what type of behavior is covered? And then looking at it, okay, do we need to look at our student code of conduct? So for example, even if, if, there's, if there's action, if there's an incident between students off campus and it wouldn't fall under the definition under Title IX and, and under the school's responsibility under Title IX, might it still be a violation to the school's code of conduct? Um, or code professionalism among students or what have you. And so it's still subject to the school's, for, for lack of a better word, jurisdiction. I mean, is it still an, you know, something that the school would have the authority to, to investigate? So those are things, again, over the next 90 days, those are the types of things as you look to update your policies and look to become compliant under the regulations, understanding, okay, how does, what's the interplay between What's required under Title IX? When do we have a liability or an obligation? We, the school, have an obligation under Title IX, and how does that tie in with our school code of conduct and making sure that we've got a system in place and we've got policies in place that cover that all? So, um, again, one of the overlying factors here is that uh, again, recipients' response must treat complainants and respondents equitably. Um, and the, the other piece of that here is that, so when a, when a school has actual knowledge, the Title IX coordinator must promptly contact the complainant to discuss availability of supportive measures. Um, and so that's something that you need to be prepared to do. And so this gets into, you know, once a school has actual knowledge, that doesn't trigger an investigation obligation. What, upon knowledge of an incident, what that triggers is that you need to be able to, you need to be prepared to provide supportive measures to the complainant, whether or not the complainant files a formal complaint and wants the school to investigate. And so, and part of those supportive measures may, will be making sure that the complainant understands what that process is, um, as far as how to file a formal complaint, what happens in, when filing a formal complaint, what's the investigation and adjudication process look like at the school so that the student, or the, the complainant, I should say, can make an informed decision on whether or not to go forward with the complaint, with a formal complaint. Um, so again, the idea is that, so if there's a formal complaint, then there's, we now have a new section 106.45, and that spells out what needs to be included in your grievance process. And so uh, now, again, with, whether or not the student files a formal complaint, 
if the school has actual knowledge, then you need to comply with what section 10644A, which I described in the prior slide, that talks about offering supportive measures to, to the complainant. A couple of things that the regulations make clear is, one is with an emergency removal. So depending on the type of complaint, depending on the allegations, um, for the safety of the students and for the safety of your, of your school community, you may decide, okay, you may think, I need to you know, remove the respondent from school on an emergency basis. And the regulations, new regs provide that you can do that, and that's, that's allowable, but here's the thing. If you do that, you need to uh, make sure you've done a, analysis, an individualized safety and risk analysis. So again, not just stereotypes, but based on the facts you've got so far, or the allegations you have so far, the information you've got, under, you know, doing a risk analysis, determine that there's an immediate threat, to any student arising from the allegations and that threat justifies the removal, and you need to provide the respondent with notice and an opportunity to challenge the decision. So it's not, so even if you decide you, you've done your risk analysis, you really, you believe that there's a threat, you've documented that, so you say, student, you know, we're gonna remove you pending our, you know, grievance, while we do our, uh, follow through with our grievance process, that student needs to have an opportunity uh, to uh, challenge that decision. And similarly, the guidance says that you can also, um, you know, notwithstanding, again, the overall goal of treating both respondents and complainants fairly, not making any formal uh, decision on liability until you've, you, until you've followed a grievance policy and you've gone through your grievance policy that complies with the new regulations. You know, there's essentially, you know, you're not, not guilty, you know, a presumption of innocence, right? You know, if we take a, a cue from, from uh, criminal law. Notwithstanding all of those general concepts, you still, you know, again, there's an opportunity uh, in certain circumstances for an emergency removal. Similarly, if it's an employee to, to require administrative leave uh, pending uh, the grievance process. So that leads us to section 10645. So what's required in your grievance process? And so there's, there's, there's 10 essential requirements that you need to have in your grievance process. So First of all, you need, it needs to treat complainants and respondents equitably. You need to have an objective evaluation of all uh, relevant evidence. It needs to be uh, conducted by, or you need to make sure that whoever's involved in the grievance process, your title line coordinators, your investigators, the decision makers, um, if you get anybody who may be working with students, if you're looking at uh, trying to uh, resolve the matter on an informal resolution, making sure that they do not have any conflict of interest or bias, and they must receive training. And there's certain requirements in the in the new regulations that, that talk about the training that's required, training on how to conduct a fair investigation, training about how to um, uh, to to prevent bias um, or conflicts of interest. So that all needs to to occur. Uh, your grievance process, you mentioned this before, a presumption that the respondent is not responsible for the alleged conduct until a determination regarding responsibility is made at the conclusion of the grievance process. Um, needs to include reasonable, reasonably prompt timeframes for the conclusion of the process, and that's something where that should be in your policies and recognizing that there may be reasons to change the time frame. So depending, so for example, you may have been involved in an investigation in March and now with COVID-19 and schools closing and transitioning to temporary distance education and things like that, you, know, you still, in one of the things under the, under the guidance that just came out yesterday on Title IX, or additional kind of COVID-19 specific questions about Title IX, you're still obligated to conduct your Title IX investigations. There's no suspension of Title IX due to COVID-19. But again, if there's a, if there's a, a reasonable delay because of, because of challenging issues, that's okay, so long as you properly notify both parties and, 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 and let them know okay, what the expectation is and making sure you're communicating equally. Again, treating complainants and respondents equitably, equitably throughout the process means that they all have equal, equal communication and you're not communicating to one person information that doesn't go to the other person. Uh, your policy needs, your process needs to describe the range of possible disciplinary sanctions. Uh, you need to state the standard of evidence to be used to determine responsibility. And so this was a big sticking point with guidance under the Obama administration. When they came out with their Title IX guidance, they were requiring that institutions use a preponderance of the evidence standard. What Secretary DeVos said in 2017 with the interim guidance and what has you know, what is now 
uh, part of the regulations that were issued is that a school can use a higher standard called clear and convincing evidence. So um, the, the idea here is that you, you need to make sure that the parties understand how much evidence needs to be, what's the standard of evidence that, that needs to be presented in order to make a determination of liability. So it's not as high as in a criminal case. So you can go back to high school uh, civics classes or you know, binge watching uh, law and order now that we're all quarantined or what have you. Uh, you know, but in a criminal case, the evidence needs to be beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's required you know, primarily because we want to make sure before we send somebody to jail, we have the, we're, we're sure of the result or we're, we're sure as we possibly, we reasonably can be. But we don't need to have that much evidence uh, under our policy. So preponderance of the evidence is a much lower evidentiary standard. It essentially means uh, what is more likely than not to have happened, uh, whereas clear and convincing evidence is somewhere in the middle. So somewhere between preponderance of the evidence and beyond a reasonable doubt. And again, some schools had a clear and convincing evidence standard in their, you know, before some of the guidance from the Obama administration. And these are serious consequences associated with these, you know, with, with these allegations. And so again, depending on your, your school and what your policies are, you, you, by regulation, it's clear you've got the choice to use either preponderance or clear and convincing evidence. So you, you need to include another big change in the regulations is including the procedures and permissible basis for the complainant and respondent to appeal. And this is a departure from the proposed regulations and previous guidance. And so you know, previous, previous guidance was that schools could have an appeal process. And I think a lot of it would depend on the size of the school, for example. So um, again, a large public land grant university with a full time Title IX office and all the support services and what have you, you know, would have the resources to have an appeal and, and, the, and I would argue the sophistication to have a process that included an appeal. Whereas a very, very small massage therapy school it may not have the resources uh, available to have an effective appeal, particularly when you talk about with your process, you need to have somebody do the investigation and whoever's doing the investigation, you need to have somebody different be the decision maker. And then if you're gonna have an appeal, you have to have somebody different who's gonna do the appeal. And so again, we're, you know, we're talking about at least three different people here who are involved in some manner in the investigation or decision-making process. Again, large public land grant university, it's not a problem finding individuals to fill those roles, but that's something where, you know, your school is going to need to think about how do we provide this? How do we how do we do this? Um, grievance procedures need to describe the range of, of supportive measures that are available. And we talked about that before, making sure that, that the, you know, when the schools I notice that they've got then they provide information about supportive measures. Um, and again, the process can't seek to uh, to get information or require provision of information that would otherwise be legally privileged. And so that gets the idea of if it's uh, privileged information, if it's confidential, that you can't you, you can't rely on, on that type of information unless a party waives that privilege. So under the formal process, under the, uh, we've got the, you have to send notice to the allegations. So once you start, so you need to provide notice to the parties, with details about uh, the incident and make sure that the, that the respondent has time to review that and have, have that information so they can adequately prepare for any initial interview. So that, you know, again, the idea is to being fair. If I'm, if I'm accused of violating the school's policy against sexual discrimination or against sexual harassment, that I've got time to prepare for, for any meetings on that. Um, the grievance needs, the, the, uh, the notice needs to make it clear that respondent is presumed not responsible uh, until the conclusion of the grievance process. Uh, parties need to make, be notified that they have the right to have an advisor of their choice uh, throughout the process. And, make, and also notice that the, uh, the school's code of conduct prohibits any party from knowingly make a false, making any false statements or providing false information during the grievance process. Um, the regulations talk about when a school must dismiss a complaint. So again, this is must. So um, if the conduct alleged in the formal complaint would not constitute sexual harassment under Title IX, that gets back to the idea of if, it, if it's, if it's um, sexual harassment, but it wasn't in relationship to an education program or activity of the school, uh, then it may, even if it's, you know, 
even if the allegation is true, it may not be harassment under Title IX. But that gets to you know, what I said before and highlighted you know, the last bullet point here is that a dismissal does not preclude action under another provision of a school's code of conduct. So even if it's not harassment under Title IX, it may still be a violation of your code of conduct and therefore uh, the school may still be taking, you know, would, would still, uh, again, under, this, under your code of conduct, investigate and adjudicate that allegation. Um, also, you need to, dis need to dismiss the complaint if it, and, well, as I said, if it doesn't occur in the education program or activity or doesn't occur against a person in the United States. So that's kind of one of the other requirements. So the school recipient may dismiss a complaint if the complainant notifies the Title IX coordinator that they would like to withdraw the formal complaint, if the respondent's no longer enrolled or employed. So if the respondent withdraws from school, then you can dismiss the complaint. Or if there are certain circumstances that prevent the school from gathering evidence. So even if, it's, if the complaint's not withdrawn, but say you know, one of the, the key parties, uh, the, the complainant does not cooperate or doesn't show up for interviews and things like that, or decides not to participate in the investigation. Um, so then we get into the process. So with the grievance process, there's the investigation process, and then there's the adjudication process. So, um, so in the investigation process, again, emphasizing that the burden, emphasizing the burden of proof is on the school. So it's not on the. There's not a burden on the respondent to prove that he or she didn't do it, for lack of a better, you know, a more elegant way to to phrase that. Uh, the, the obligation is on the, the institution to collect enough evidence to make a determination regarding, uh, regarding responsibility. The parties need to have an equal opportunity to present witnesses, including fact and expert witnesses, uh, not restrict the ability of either party to discuss the allegations under investigation. Uh, the parties need to have an opportunity to have others present, including an advisor of their choice. That you know, We talked about that uh, earlier as well. Um, providing the parties you know, written notice of the time, date, location, participants, and the purpose of all hearings, interviews, or other meetings with sufficient time to prepare. So again, that gets the idea of treating people fairly. You're not going to say, hey, um, we want to interview you. Here, here is a list of allegations against you. We want to interview you, you tomorrow. You, know, you need to make sure that there's sufficient time for that party to prepare for such a, you know, for such a meeting. Both parties need to have an opportunity to inspect any evidence that's obtained as part of an investigation. And then with that, so part of the documentation requirement is that the, the school creates an investigation report that summarizes the relevant evidence. And at least 10 days prior to any hearing, each party's, or party's, each party's advisor uh, or the party themselves, if they don't have an advisor, has an opportunity to review the investigation report and provide a response to that investigation report. So that's part of the, so that's the investigation process. Now, upon completion of investigation process, one of the things that, that the new regulations require is for secondary, for, for post-secondary institutions, that there is a live hearing. And so that's something where a lot of schools did not have or not require live hearings as part of their investigation process, or as part of their adjudication process, I should say. They would have what was referred to as a single investigator uh, process, where there would be an, an an ongoing investigation and kind of a back and forth with the investigator, with the parties. And at the end of the day, there would be an investigation report that would have a findings. And what the new regulations make clear is that no, for post-secondary institutions, you, your grievance process must include for live hearing. And one of the big points with the live hearing is that they want to, the department wants to ensure that the parties have an opportunity for cross-examination. And that is, that the parties have an opportunity. So if, if, if someone is, a, if the respondent has an opportunity to question the complainant and or any witnesses that might be brought against the respondent as, and, and that's the respondent's right uh, you know, to, in, in an opportunity to defend him or herself. So the way that that works though, but the department does talk in the preamble to the regulations and does raise, you know, and, and is respectful of concerns about complainants having to be subjected to cross-examination by the respondent. So the idea that if I've accused somebody of, uh, of assaulting me and you know, now I've got to go into a hearing, I've got to go into a live hearing, and then I have to be subjected to that person questioning me um, you know, directly, 
that that may be traumatic, that that might put a chilling effect on whether or not I even want to file a complaint. And maybe I don't file a complaint because I don't want to go through that process. So what the department, the process that the department has put in the regulations. And so what schools will need to do is we've got to provide for this cross-examination, but it's not going to be parties asking parties questions. It's going to be the party's advisoring, I'm sorry, the party's advisor asking those questions. And the regulations require that the, the, the cross-examination is at a live hearing. It must be conducted directly, orally, and in real time by the, by the party's advisor of choice. Uh, what you can do, though, is that what the schools can do, and you know we've seen this, and actually already been part of dis disciplinary actions, you know, using Zoom, for example. But you can, if you use technology, so long as the decision makers and the parties are able to simultaneously see and hear the the questions and the answers in real time. So you don't have to have the parties together in a room somewhere. You can do you can do your hearing remotely, you can do your cross-examination remotely, again, so long as it's with video technology and the parties are able to see, uh, simultaneously see and hear each other. So one of the things regulations talk about as well is that only relevant cross-examination questions can be asked. So again, the party's advisor will be the ones asking the questions. The decision maker at the hearing will determine whether or not uh, the, the questions are relevant. And so, you know, that gets into things like past sexual conduct generally is irrelevant unless it's specifically related to, um, you know, concerning spe the specific events in the complaint uh, and offered, you know, for example, if the respondent is offering to prove, you know, asking questions about particular sexual conduct that's offered to prove that the party, that there was consent involved in, in, the, uh, in the incident. Uh, but generally, those types of questions would be deemed to be irrelevant. Um, or non-relevant. So one of the things also that's important here, this middle bullet point on cross-examination, if a party does not have an advisor present at a live hearing, then the school is required to provide that party an advisor to assist them and without any fee to the party. So that, so that again, so that that party has somebody to conduct a cross-examination on their behalf. So that could be, so you might, my initial thought on that, quite frankly, is okay, thinking about well, what does that look like at our schools and who do you provide as, you know, as an advisor for a party who needs one? And you know, is that going to open up liability for a school because they provided an advisor that, you know, that at the end of the day, perhaps that party um, you know, is, is, is disciplined or expelled from school for, for violating school policy and they turn around and, and have a claim against the school because the school gave them a bad advisor. I mean, those are some of the things that, again, I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how those play out, but that's certainly, in looking at that particular provision, that's one question that popped to the top of my head. A um, couple other things, again, the importance of this concept of cross-examination. So the departments in this, they, they said this in the proposed regulations, and it's here in the final regulations. If a party or a witness does not submit to cross-examination at the live hearing, then the decision maker cannot rely on any statement of that party or a witness in reaching a determination. So if you've got a witness statement and it's particularly damning, but that witness does not show up at the live hearing, does not subject themselves to cross-examination, then you can't rely on that statement in making a final determination. Um, you talked about you know, being able to have the, the hearings remotely and the recipients of the schools need to create an audio or visual recording or transcript of any live hearing. And that needs to be made available for, to either of the parties. So you need to make sure you're recording those, uh, those process. Um, once you've re made a written, so once you made a determination of responsibility, you've got to complete a, 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 you've got to document that. And so that documentation needs to include these items in that. So identifying the allegations, the description of, of the procedural steps that the school took in making that determination, the findings, uh, conclusions regarding the application of the school's code of conduct to the facts, uh, statement of rationale for the result of each allegation, and the procedures for permissible appeal. So that written determination needs to go to the party simultaneously, and ultimately, if there's any if there's any remedies uh, that are part of that final determination, the Title IX coordinator is responsible for implementing them. 
So as I mentioned before, schools have to offer an appeal process. An appeal, and, and the appeal is not a relitigation, if you will, of the complaint. Um, it's not a reinvestigation. It's not uh, a, a new hearing. But there's certain there, there's certain limited basis on which a party can appeal. So if there was a procedural irregularity, so again, if if you, know, you could appeal, say if if a um, if a party alleges that the school didn't follow their policies. Um, if there's new evidence that was not uh, reasonably available at the time the determination was made, that could affect the outcome. Or if there's an allegation that one of the that the Title IX coordinator, the investigator, or decision maker had a conflict of interest or bias that affected the outcome. Um, I've included in here some of the descriptions as far as informal resolution, and that's something that um, has been in Title IX uh, policies and is. Uh, was referenced in the in the proposed regs as well, but it's included here in the final regulations is the idea that if the parties agree to in uh, a resolution without going to, through the full formal investigation and adjudication process, that that's okay. Uh, really, the only limit is that you, the schools can't provide an informal resolution process to resolve allegations that an that an employee sexually harassed a student. Um, but otherwise, it's something. But the, the key point for an informal resolution process is that it's voluntary. You can't force either party into that. And if the parties choose not to proceed with an informal resolution, then you would go through the formal investigation and adjudication process. A um, couple of interesting things on record keeping under the regulations. So you need to keep your records for seven years. So for seven years, you need to keep a record of each sexual harassment investigation. Uh, any appeals, any informal resolutions. You also need to, I mentioned before, that the requirement to train train your Title IX coordinators and, and really anybody who at your school who might be involved in these processes. So anybody who would be on a hearing panel, anybody who would be involved in an investigation, anybody who would be involved in an appeal, decision makers there, you, they need to receive training. And not only that, but the training materials that you use to train those individuals need to be made publicly available on your website assuming you have a website. If you don't have a website, then you need to be, then, then they need to be publicly available upon request. But assuming you all have websites, you, you, know, it, you need to include your Title IX training materials on your website for seven years. And something else that the, the regulations included, just uh, emphasizing again, retaliate, you know, pro prohibiting retaliation against those who, um, who might, against complainants or anybody who's a, who's testified or any witnesses who's participated in a Title IX investigation. So you, you need to make sure that you've got uh, your policy is clear, uh, prohibiting retaliation. And again, that's something that quite frankly should have been in your policies uh, already, but that's emphasized here too in, in, the, in the final regs. Um, so that's a that's a lot of information, as, and as I said, that's just kind of scratching the surface. So okay, here's all that's required. But you know, with each one of those slides, each one of those bullet points, you know, I know I've got a lot of questions still, and I'm sure you 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 probably have questions as well. And, and that's something over the next uh, you know, three months as we continue to digest this and and and, and process these two thousand plus pages of, of new regulations and, and and information about those regulations. It's also going to be interesting to see. I mean, we've already seen uh, uh, comments about the new regulations. For example, um, you know, Joe Biden has already you know, publicly said that if he gets elected president, he's going to uh, you know, change these regulations. Uh, there's been a lot of folks in Congress, a lot of Democrats in Congress, who have talked about changing um, these you know, these regulations and, and who have expressed displeasure with where the departments come out on this. So. Uh, it's it, it's going to be an interesting, certainly three months, and it's certainly going to be an interesting year to see what happens uh, with these. But that's where we are now. We've got we finally have new final regulations, and they are effective August 14th, uh, 2020. So just just with that, what we've included here in the slides are there was uh, an additional guidance issued yesterday re related to um, uh, Title IX and. COVID-19 national emergency. And so we've included those uh, in here. I mean, the basic thing there to remember is that Title IX still applies. Um, and, you know, the federal disability laws still apply. You know, Section 504 still applies. So again, making sure that you're uh, compliant, making sure that if you, you know, you're responding to complaints, if you've got investigations that, you know, to the best of your ability, that you're still moving forward with, uh, with fulfilling your obligations 
under uh, under Title IX under the Civil Rights Acts under Section 504, you know, protecting students uh, from from harassment and students with disabilities, notwithstanding the challenges that we're um, that we're facing. So, with that, I'm going to take a deep breath and uh, pass the baton. So, I'm not sure if I need to pass the uh, control of the webinar, or if I'll just click when you tell me to click, or how you want to proceed from you're just here. Gonna, you're just going to click when we say click. I can do that. So, uh, Chris, that was awesome and a lot of information. I have one quick question before sure. anybody else asks. I know you do Cleary training. Do you also do Title IX clearing? Yes. Training? Okay. Yes. So Chris's information is at the end. He does provide Title IX training. You did hear him say that your people have to be trained. And that's something people forget about all the time. So the information is there. You can contact him or some other companies also do training, but just a heads up. As you could tell, he was pretty knowledgeable about it and quick notice there. So we appreciate that. So Thank you guys have started to get your money and you're excited. You've got student grant funds coming in finally. I still have a few people struggling to get through the application process, but sounds like most of you are getting through that first hurdle. Thanks to Tom's help and uh, I've been able to answer a few questions because of his help. And you breathed a sigh of relief and you thought, okay, so now when the Department of Ed sends out this little format, I just have to report what I did. Not so easy. So as you saw, we did get some notification about um, reporting, but not just reporting. You have to post information now on your homepage and it says prominently on your website. So that means it's not gonna be three or four clicks away. It has to be where it's easily accessible. And you have to tell them basically within 30 days of receipt of funds. So that initial announcement within the letter from uh, uh, Betsy DeVos said that, you know, once 30 days from your certification, well, then I think they realized schools weren't getting their money right away, that type of thing. Wasn't so there. Yeah, so now it says 30 days from receipt of the funds, you have to post something on your website, and then again, every 45 days after your initial submission. So, one of the things that you have to do, <laughs> list that you've acknowledged, that you signed and returned the Department of Ed certification and agreement. I don't know why you have to acknowledge that because you don't get any money unless you did it, but you still have to acknowledge it and that you're going to use no less than 50%, that's the student grant funds, under section 18004A1 of the CARES Act to provide the financial emergency grants to the students. So that's, that's your first thing that you have to do. Go ahead, Chris. And then you have to publish the total amount of funds that the institution will receive or has received from the department under the HERF student, student grants. So now you're publicly going to tell every single student exactly how much you got, which I'm sure is going to cause a lot of um, questions. If a student you didn't get some of that money because there are universities out there with huge pots of money but certainly not enough to go around for all the students that they have some of us smaller schools you know we we have enough funds to share or we can justify that most of our students are Pell eligible so you gave it to the Pell eligible students whatever your justification was it's not going to be so easy for some of these bigger schools uh, you also have to acknowledge the total amount dispersed to students to date of the submission. So some of you are going to reserve some of that money. Some of you may have spent all of that money up front. Uh, some of you are probably going to wait and see. Some of you may have that money and not spend any of it yet. You're waiting for more guidance because you don't know exactly who to give it to or how to award it or anything else. I know some of you rushed to spend it because the, the initial notification in the letter said uh, they were hoping you would disperse funds immediately because students had a need. Then you're not so sure if that's what you should be doing. And then the estimated total number of students at the uh, institution that are eligible to participate in the programs and eligible to receive the HERF grants. Well, again, if you had a lot 
cash paying students, you may not know how many students could be eligible. Unless those students have filed a FAFSA since you've received those grant monies and you've had a chance to look at those uh, FAFSAs. And then again, is that current need? Information there is two years old. Who knows what the current situation is for these students? I don't know if any of you are doing some type of uh, uh, communication to the student, maybe a survey to find out, have they lost jobs? Do they need the money? Those types of things. So again, it's a whole challenge to try to figure out at this point, once you receive the funds, how you're gonna spend it and how many total students you're going to have. We can use enrollments up through June at this point, up to June 1st, what about if they extend it? I think we're all thinking the Department of Ed is going to have to extend that, extend that June 1st date, but of course we don't have that additional information yet. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, the total number of students who've received an emergency grant to date. The methods used by the institution to determine which students are going to receive those funds and how much they're going to receive. So again, you're going to put in there how many students have received money up to date, how many more students you think are going to receive money, how much money these students received. Now, you're not going to list the students' names or any personal identifiable information per se, but you do have to um, say how many students are getting the money, what rationale you used, how did you determine who was going to get what? Did you use some type of a formula? Did you only do your Pell eligible students? Did you base it on the need from a FAFSA? Did you just divide it among all the students that were eligible at this school? Whatever you did, you're going to have to report how you determined what you were going to use and what you did use. And then any instructions, directions, or guidance that you, the institution, actually gave the student concerning the emergency financial aid grants. Hopefully at the minimum, you sent them a cover letter telling them that they had to use the grants for those items that were listed uh, to be used for, such as um, food, food, housing, food, housing, health care, child care, other emergency things due to disruptive of, uh, education during coronavirus. So they could list they had to buy a laptop. They could list, you know, things that they needed for the school, but Hopefully you did give them the guidance and sent them a cover letter. It would be nice if you sent something requiring a signature saying, yes, I will use these funds for these items, but that definitely wasn't a requirement up front for you to do. So um, I now have schools calling me and saying, uh, I wish I'd never taken these funds and dispersed it. Even though you know they're, they're for your students and, and the students desperately need that money. I can just visualize the biggest problem you're going to have is trying to explain to the students that you didn't give the money to why they didn't get me. So I'm sure that's going to be something that you have to prepare for because once it's all public information, I think the phone calls will increase. Well, and keep in mind, Sally, that it already is public information. The Department of Education through the forward facing portion of uh, studentaid.gov and the the access through cell phones, smart technology, and other technology has made students aware and encouraged them to call and talk to their financial aid offices at their institutions for that very reason. Right. So, although we were aware it was going to be public information, I don't think they would have seen on a website that, you know, one student got $2,000, another student got $6,000 right. or the Pell equivalent. And, uh, I think that's going to generate more questions than just, I got money and I'm not going to worry about what anybody else got. So it'll well, be- it brings, it, bring, it brings us back to the fact that the policies that are being developed uh, as you're as in, at the institutional level prior to, or as you're dispersing these funds become critically important because those last three, uh, those last two areas uh, are what's going to drive those decision-making processes and the ability to then utilize those in the future as the justification and validation for how the money was distributed is going to be key, not only for this part of the process, but for subsequent reviews later on in the future, whether it be by the department or others. I agree. Before Tom starts, I just wanna mention, uh, I know the webinar said that you probably would have some guidance on RTT4, leave of absences, um, 
and a litany of other things we've been expecting answers to, and we are still expecting answers to. And at, Tom tells me every day that his insider folks are telling him today, today, today. But you have to remember, guys, they don't have any control. They have written their responses. It's gone over to OMB for, for approval, and until it gets approved, and sometimes it'll go back and forth, depending on what's going on. But until they release it, we're stuck without any other answers. Well, I can say, and as we've shared before, as we've shared before, Principal, uh, Principal Deputy Undersecretary Diane Howard Jones literally shared with me on a webinar a week ago yesterday uh, that she anticipated them to come out before the end of the week last week. Many of the FAME community was on some of those calls as well. Um, what I continue to hear from Diane, as well as from others, uh, including the policy individuals within the Office of Policy, Planning, and Innovation who are actually working on or worked on those portions of the proposal, uh, they're in effect done, but as you said, Sally, and as you and I have talked about, sometimes their capability to complete the process is then beholden to other people's review and eventual sign off. And sometimes that unfortunately takes a little longer. And as you said, and as we've discussed previously, requires a little pass back and forth before they actually post. Um, I will tell you conversations yet again as recently as 10 minutes before this webinar uh, from individuals in the know believe that the information is coming soon. Uh, one of the packages was the information that was provided yesterday in terms of the Office of Civil Rights uh, updates with regard to the uh, utilization of uh, Americans with Disabilities Act requirements under Title IX. So they are seeing things incrementally come out and come forward. And one of the things that is high in that queue and the, what we anticipated hopefully would have come out last week but are still waiting on is what we had hoped to talk about today, R2T4, uh, satisfactory academic progress, financial responsibility under the composite scores. Uh, another huge one that I know institutions have asked about on multiple occasions is relief from the audit requirements in terms of the deadlines for submissions of audits. Uh, Diane Hour jones did say that that would be a portion of the new guidance. You talked earlier today, Sally, in your pre presentation with regard to the HERF funds about the June 1 effective date. Uh, the Principal Deputy Undersecretary said specifically that in the forthcoming guidance that that period of time will be extended. She said that it will be significantly extended. Now, we're left to de determine what that is. Some people are speculating August or September. Others are saying till the end of the year. I don't have any determination or definitive word on what the time frame is, but um, it, it seems to me that the department is going to extend that well into the future. And that comes back full circle to items six and seven and the disbursement of these funds. Recognizing that students that are enrolling now or enrolled after March 13th through June 1st, and potentially now June 1st to some undefined period in the future, have eligibility for these funds, again, if they meet the requirements related to disruptions in their academic-related activities as a result of COVID, that they're eligible for the student portions of the funds and potentially the overage or any uh, residual amounts of the institutional funds that the institutions want to apply to their students. So still a lot of questions and still a lot of things that we have to uh, be mindful of as, uh, as we continue to go forward. Uh, I do hear uh, when, when, when Diane was on the phone last week, she said that close to 80% of the funds had been dispersed on this from their assessment of those institutions eligible to obtain those funds, uh, and that the ones that are not were basically smaller ones that potentially were not aware. So the department is trying to uh, provide notice to institutions that haven't submitted to at least inform them uh, that's another part of the process that they have undertaken to ensure that the intent and the will of Congress to provide these funds to all eligible entities is, the word has gotten out. Uh, there are some institutions that are having a couple of stragglers in terms of OPE ID numbers and the ability for all of their funds to be released, which again causes problems because if you've got 
two campuses will make it the most simplistic argument or uh, example. If I've got a main campus and a branch, and the main campus has got their funding, but the branch has not, do you want to administer the funds or disperse the funds to the, the, the campus that has it and have your student at the other campus go, well, well wait, what happened about, what about us? Uh, so those are yet again, things that institutions are having to grapple with on their own uh, as these funds are slow to move out. Uh, I have also heard of, of schools getting the institutional portions of their funds as well now. So the process is moving forward on both ends. Okay, thanks, Tom. Also, last week I mentioned uh, that you couldn't do hybrids, and I was reminded by Tom that you might be able to because there were some schools doing it. And then we've talked to uh, some of the accrediting agencies, and apparently most of them are allowing either a soft go back to school or a hybrid, whatever, depending, because of limited cash, classroom space and, and that type of thing. Um, I will tell you that I know that NACUS is working toward doing something for you guys, so hang in there. I think you'll hear some information, I think you said sometime next week. So um, hopefully, that will be the last one that allows you to go ahead and do some type of uh, hybrid or soft going back to school. Um, I know that they, they've been working through it just like everybody else. There's a lot of questions out there still on what you can do. But hang in there, guys. We're going to get there. I don't know what normal is going to be, but I guess our new normal is going to be certainly different than what it is now. I did see today LA is not going to allow their university students to go back to campus in the fall. So it looks like they're all going to be online in the fall. So I'm sure that these universities are really going to hurt because uh, they count on that whole room board on campus. And a lot of students, I think, because they can't do the on campus experience, may decide not to go to college yet. It'll be interesting. May forego. Yep. Okay, Tom, go ahead. Well, that couldn't have been a better segue, Sally. A um, couple of things happening here in Washington, D.C. One of them was a uh, hearing yesterday uh, where the big four, uh, in a lot of respects, from uh, the president's oversight staff were involved in a hearing talking about COVID-19 and reopening and returns to the workforce and whether or not uh, those information th that information uh, would be good or bad to reopen and what the consequences potentially could be with regard to that. Um, you know, we've gone through all of this, Chris, so we're basically just on the Q&A and my real quick report. Um, what they came to what they came to discuss and what Fauci as well as uh, Admiral Greer, Greer, Greer and others discussed with Senator Alexander and all of the Senate Health Committee individuals was that there's basically two things that people are looking for with regard to reopening. And specifically, Senator Alexander asked the, the panelists, well, if I'm the chancellor of the University of Tennessee and she wants to try and put confidence into the parents and students that they can return in August and we have then they have plans in place, surveillance strategies is one of the new key buzzwords and terms uh, it, in place, can they come back or will they be able to come back? And the short answer was, again, no surprise, it depends. Uh, it depends on whether or not uh, testing is available, whether or not the degree to which there is uh, a, a community spread, another key term, how much of the local community uh, is susceptible to or has either a current status or rising status of COVID um, um, and the acknowledgements of new individuals, what the testing will look like and whether or not the individuals feel comfortable with whatever that institution has established. So the long and the short of it was cutting to the chase, Fauci and others said, yes, you can be open. Yes, there are ways in which to try and control and react and respond in the event that unfortunate circumstances happen while you're at the institution. But he was also very quick to say that there will not be and there cannot be any actual vaccine or full on treatment programs that will be able to protect individuals if they were to go on campus and then contract the disease. They would then be re re subject to the quarantines and again, how the institutions would 
deal with those circumstances are a case by case and institution by institution set of circumstances. So it was rather unique uh, to listen to those discussions and the contemplation that the fall term is very much up to uh, institutions. And that's to your point, Sally, I think some institutions are simply not willing or not going to be willing to take the, the leap of faith to bring all students back on campus. The surveillance strategies that they allude to are the things that would need to be done in the event that once students are back on campus, that one or more individuals start to contract the disease. Uh, Fauci said and was published in the news last night from this hearing that he anticipates and the CDC, the National Institute of Health and others anticipate that there will be a number of spikes along the way and that issues like this, like the return to uh, the degree of normalcy will be a part of what may very well bring about those spikes. Uh, the Admiral was quick to point out that one of the key determinants, they all still believe on the ability to control or to the best way, in the best way possible, protect from a, 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 a major uh, new, a new uh, outbreak is social distancing. And the reality is that institutions that are looking to come back are going to likely very, very much have to take into consideration social distancing requirements or uh, goals and objectives as part of uh, what they what they do. So it was an informative hearing. Uh, I would encourage individuals to watch it. There was the other side of this dynamic, which was Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky, who was expressing frustrations because the state of Kentucky has not seen the level of outbreak and of the pandemic as certainly other broader, larger urban communities like New York or Texas or Florida or elsewhere have seen in these more rural environments, he submitted that his concern was the antithesis of this, which is the decision and the overarching pressure to remain closed is having not only a dilutive effect on the economy, but potentially on the education and well-being of students, whether that be at the elementary and secondary level or at the higher education level, and said that maybe there does need to be some differentiation <clears throat> based on location. Fauci and others were quick to point out that while that may be the case today, it may not be the case tomorrow. So there's the push and pull and the tension that we all see. What are the chances and Chris, you might have some insight on this one. So suppose I'm a little cosmetology school, mm -hmm. open up my clinic and either a student or a patron uh, claims they get the virus from my location. Are you gonna be subject to lawsuits? Uh, do you think there's gonna be a lot of that happening? Well, I think there's a concern for it. I think some of the proposed legislation out there is that it would protect businesses that open from uh, liability and so that's one of the I think that's you know that's certainly an issue as far as any reopening plan is how to you know what are, what are the CDC guidance what is local health officials uh, what you know what's their guidance you know, in, in working on a plan and, and making sure you're training students and staff employees you know, instructors and, and, and doing everything that you can to limit that because if you do have a claim then it's going to be well what you know, they're, they're going to look to see well what did what did the school do? Were you negligent in opening? Were you rushing to open and getting people back? Or were you doing everything that you're supposed to be doing and were you doing it diligently and did you train? I mean, those, those are issues, but we've certainly seen, you know, I don't think people are afraid to file lawsuits. Um, you know, we've seen schools, yeah. you know, schools are getting sued. You know, you know, a lot of the traditional schools are getting sued about, you know, switching to online training and it's not, a, you know, and that's not what students signed up for. I think right. if people start getting sick, and they can point the fingers to, to you know to a school or to a clinic. Um, I mean, I think you need to be prepared for that and making sure you're doing everything you can to limit your exposure with that. Do you think? I think one of the canaries. In, I think one of the canaries in the minefield for that is Liberty University, uh, that decided not to close even for their prior term. Uh, they have been open throughout the course of the entire uh, pandemic, and you know, you haven't heard a lot about that subsequent to their decision to move forward with staying open. Um, to, to both of your points with regard to, and again, thanks for teeing it up. It's almost like we planned this, but we didn't. Uh, there is a great deal of focus right now on Capitol Hill about protection of the employers, 
uh, and with regard to liabilities around indi uh, individuals contracting the virus, uh, and also a number of focuses on the relationship between the res responsibilities of the institution, but also the individual uh, determinations and decision making of individuals at the institutional level to attend or to not attend as well. Um, interestingly enough, one of the major areas of dispute is over this liability issue between the Republicans and the Democrats. The House this week came up with a new comprehensive almost three trillion dollar proposal of the next round of stimulus funding uh, it literally is a comprehensive who's who of all of the different politically charged discussions and focus everything from the post offices that you've heard about in the recent news but it also includes a great deal of focus on yet again education and some i think the estimate i saw i saw when i added up the numbers and I've got a summary that uh, I just shared with Fame so you all will have it um, of about a hundred another hundred billion dollars but those funds are targeted almost exclusively hell they are exclusively to public institutions of higher education and minority serving institutions the for-profit sector very much similar to the College Affordability Act need not apply because we're not eligible Yeah, it's it's an interesting scenario. I didn't I didn't know if whether schools, you know, like should have patrons sign something saying that schools use all precautions, but if they I got I think there's gonna be a lot of that going forward. Not yeah. unlike with even with the restaurants and others, with again with social distancing, only limiting a certain number of individuals in or developing virtu using virtual in the same instit institution to have the instructor and potentially half the class in one room and the other half of the class potentially in another room so you can meet the social distancing requirements. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that are gonna have to be part of the, the, the continuation of the discussion of the transition back if and when the, the schools are, are allowed to come back. You still have states where they're not permitted based on the governor's directions, uh, Pennsylvania being one and a number of others where they can't and others where they can and others where only some can and others can't. It's gonna be a state by state and you know, basically in some instances, discipline by discipline set of circumstances. Yeah, thank you. All right, so let's open it up to questions. Chris, do you have anything? All right, thank you guys for all that information. So we're gonna have to speed through this a little bit. We have quite a few questions. The first one, is if I have a student who is not returning from LOA due to pregnancy and fear of COVID, I may have to drop her because within the next 180 days, it's gonna go outside of that LOA period. How can I go about not giving her a failing grade? The, uh, let me try Sally first yeah. um, and see if you even agree with what I'm about to say. Uh, while we do not have all of the SAP guidance yet under the CARES Act, the CARES Act does contemplate the fact that if the, the departure is related to COVID, uh, that the actual quantitative measures of that particular payment period or that term do not necessarily have to be computed by uh, the institution and that the student therefore would not have to appeal to have those removed or, or protected. Uh, again, the emphasis here is I'm a little bit concerned because it's twofold. Is it because of her pregnancy or is it because of COVID? Uh, you, you, I, you know, that's that's where well, document, document, document is going to be a very, very important key. My concern is if she's on LOA, it has nothing to do with her having a failing grade. She must have been failing before she went on her LOA. And if that's the case, I don't think you can get away without giving her a failing grade because she didn't get any grades while she was on an LOA. And mm -hmm. the fact that she drops, you know, unless you give her an F when she drops, I, I mean, I'm not sure what your grading policy is, but normally, you know, it's based on, you know, where they're at at the point when they drop. So I would say if she was failing before she went on LOA, she's still failing. Great, thank you for that, Sally and Tom. Um, 
so here's the next question. Now that the Department of Education has extended the online classes, are schools allowed to do both online and on-campus classes? They haven't extended yet. And on top of that, it depends on the accrediting right now. Okay, next question. Can we disperse student loan payments for active students who are eligible for the disbursement prior to a temporary suspension of classes? Only if they were in attendance when the loan came in. You can never do a loan disbursement when somebody's on an LOA, regardless of the reason. Thank you. Next question. What steps must the school take in order to reopen campus? Do we need approval from the department, NACUS? I know any IHE must work directly with their health departments to determine a plan for return. Who else is required to approve our plan? I think only with your guidelines from your area that you're in. You know, like uh, some areas are allowing schools to open, others are not. So I think once they say that you can open up your school, you can if you can do it safely and stay within the guidelines of what needs to be done. Thank you. Next question. This is regarding the grievance process. Can the respondent be suspended while the investigation is conducted, or does the school have to keep the respondent in school? In other words, how do we separate the complainant and the respondent in a school such as ours where clock hours are important? So that's where the, the regulations contemplate that, and there's a provision in there that says you can remove a respondent. Uh, you can do an emergency removal of a respondent, but in that case, that re it requires that you've made a determination that there's um, that there is a health and safety risk that requires you know you've documented the reasons why you've made that emergency removal of the student from class, and you need to provide the student with an opportunity to challenge that. And so, in making sure that the respondent has an opportunity to challenge your decision, so you you are allowed to do that. Uh, that that gets into the bigger question of with your school. I mean, if you do, if you are conducting an investigation, if you if you've got if you've initiated the formal grievance policy, um, how do you how do you manage you know the the relationship between the the complainant and the respondent? Because again, you need to treat everybody fairly. But again, there may be circumstances where you can't where keeping them together is not an option. Um, but that's going to be you know that that's an individual analysis for each institution and each program. But the overall idea is, yes, you, you can remove the student from class uh, pending an investigation so long as you meet that requirement and, and they've got, you know, you make that determination and that student's got a right to challenge uh, him or her being removed. Thank you, Chris. Next question. Can HERF institutional funds be used to prepare a campus for reopening and complying with the new learning environments, for example, PPE, extra maintenance for cleanliness, expanding from a single classroom to multiple classrooms to maintain social distance, hybrid classes with some students in class and others still doing the distance learning via webcam? I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Do you, Tom? I would I say some of those will most definitely be included. Other portions of it are a little bit more iffy. Uh, the language yet again is what everybody is falling back on and respect with respect to the, the institutional side, it relates to the disruptions related to uh, the delivery of the academic programs. Uh, I think you can make the case, I, I this is Tom Netting, great big asterisk. I think you can make the case that in order to be able to do all of the things that are on that list, you need the assistance to be able to do, do so the PPE, the sanitation, as well as all the technological issues um, that are that were that were included in that list. I definitely feel more comfortable that the technological side is, part, is, is likely to be included. Uh, I would tell you that I think that some of the other um, softer portions of it, but nevertheless equally important to prevent any future outbreaks and to protect the student population uh, are things that they're discussing and I hope will be part of the guidance that's forthcoming. Thank you. Next question. If you have a Title IX training every year, you have to keep adding it to the website until you have seven years showing? 
That's a good question. That's what it reads. I mean, it reads that you, you've got to keep a record of the Title IX training materials that you've used. Yeah. Great. All right. Next question. Can you clarify the reporting due within 30 days of signing the certification? We would like to be compliant, but we're unsure of the expectations from Department of Ed. The statute was what actually said 30 days from uh, the, uh, the submission. The department took that interpretation and made it more realistic to say 30 days from receipt of funds because they recognized what nobody knew at the time, which was the glitches we've all experienced in the process of submitting your application and getting the release of funds by the department. So the 30 days starts from your receipt of the actual first round of student funding and the 45 days and all of the subsequent periods. Agreed, Sally? Yeah, I'm not sure if they wanna know content or if they wanna know the actual reporting deadline. We just talked about the content and I did skip the last page, but everything's right there um, of what you have to report. So it's basically with your policy, the number of students, the dollars spent to date, and all of that other information. Um, so Tom's told you the one side about the reporting requirements. This is the other information that you need. Thank you, Chris. Trying to help. <laughs> Thank you. You always do. Put your contact information back up, the, the, the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> they may know how to reach you. That's it. Leave that one right there so they know how to reach you. I do not want anybody asking me questions about Title IX. <laughs> that goes straight to Chris's email. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, Tom can help answer once he finishes reading. Uh, well, it's, it's not a, a question, but it's more like a statement. I was advised yesterday that the HERF notice does not have to be on the home page. This was from CECU. Prominently displayed, I think is the wording used. So I would assume it's the school's landing page, but maybe I'm incorrect. Can we use school HERF portion towards our non-eligible students? No. 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 Bingo. <laughs> yeah, at least we all agree. <laughs> Do we have to report only the student portion or both institutional and student funds? How or where can we acknowledge with the Department of Ed? How can awards be calculated if all students were disrupted? Well, the report, so the reporting, the, first, the guidance that we've got now, this the 30-day report is for the student portion, but there's there's going to be reporting on the institutional portion as well. We haven't received the guidance from the department yet on what that looks like. And even with the institutional reporting, I mean, this is preliminary guidance because this the department hasn't put out information on how we're actually going to present this information or schools are actually going to submit this information to the department themselves. This is all about posting it on your website and getting that information out publicly. Um, so there's going to be more guidance and more information about exactly what gets reported, particularly you know what reporting is going to need to be done on the institutional pieces of it. Thank you. Agreed. This is an interesting question. I have a student that dropped and is going to another institution. She was in attendance when I decided to give funds to all eligible students. Should I still give her the funds? I think that's your choice, whatever you wrote in your policy, whether or not you wrote in your policy that you would give it to students that were no longer there, or if you were only going to give it to active students, if you were gonna include students on leave of absence, whatever your policy was that you wrote and you were supposed to write all that, so. But if you said but, in your policy that you were going to give it to students that had been at, in school at the time and, that, and was disrupted at that time, then yeah, you have to still give it to her, I think. And there is clarification that was provided by the department um, in their FAQs and additional information that individuals, graduates, as well as withdrawals that were enrolled at the time, some point in time between that March 13th and 
X to point of departure, uh, that they are eligible as the institution sees fit to deliver them, as Sally said. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, you're going to have students you're going to give money to that aren't going to come back, let's face it. Mm. We know our student population. We know if some of them got a big lump sum, they may not find that, that going back to school is high priority yet until they realize that they've got to come back at some point or they don't get a job. But, you know, I, I think we're going to see some losses regardless. Yes. Do we and that's where unfortunately. Sorry. And that's where, unfortunately, things like the protections that the Congress thought they were putting in place to not require the return of the R2T4 for purposes of uh, federal funds, whether that be the grants or the loans, they did that in an order to try and provide relief to students. But you can make the argument that those students then departing without the completion of their program, they may not have to return those funds but they also, but they are obligated to repay those loan funds down the road. Yeah. Okay, next question. Do we have to send an additional cover letter to a student if we will post information on the website and instructing them on what to do if they want to request the funds? I think it's good practice to do that so that there's no doubt about that the student received the information. Your students aren't always gonna to go to the website. I, th I think you want to you want to make sure that this that you can show that you deliver directly to the students information on how to you know, on the allowable use of the funds. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. That was very clear. I keep hearing these huge amounts. Mine works out to be about four hundred to five hundred and fifty dollars per student, depending on how I can distribute. Am I missing something? Nope. It was based on your Pell eligible population, 75% of it. And it was also based on full time. So some of these big universities are complaining because so many of their students were not full time and did not get a lot of money, especially the junior colleges. That's why this next package is going to go to the not for profit, big universities, etc. Mm. If it comes through so that uh, because that initial allocation, remember, was based on full-time enrollment and I think reported on iPads. Thank you. And I think this is going to wrap it up. Our last question. What if posting a formula used to determine the allocations and the exact amount allows someone to solve the formula to find out information about a group of less than 10 students? Uh, do you post the amount students will receive or just the formula and note the posting amounts would if violate it was FERPA? Students, if it was uh, students and it was less than 10 students, they didn't have to post anything. That's the one slide that I jumped forward. Oh, okay. Get a chance to answer. So if it's a small amount of students and it's less than 10, it doesn't have to be posted. Okay. Let's see, wait, we have two more minutes. Uh, okay. Let's see. What is the deadline of TDE at this time? Right now, Temporary it's Temporary distance first. education. Go ahead, Sally. Right now, it's June 1st. Anybody that enrolls prior up to June 1st, uh, we know that's going to be extended. We just don't know how long. Okay. Thank you guys so much. It's a lot of You're information welcome. today. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate all your knowledge and reading over 2,000 pages so that you can do this presentation for us. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic job, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Everybody have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Stay safe. We will do another webinar next week. I'm not sure what it is. I think we're going to try to get our accrediting agencies on. Um, we'll have to see what works for them, but we will be doing something next week. I'm not going to promise any information from Department of Ed on <laughs> R2T4 satisfactory progress or any of that. I'm other going to go out on the limb. I will say it. By next week, we will have something more to share. Wow. <laughs> okay, Tom, we believe. 
that's Tom's section. Everybody have a good day. <laughs> right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.